Uh, today we um, have a pretty light agenda, uh, which whenever that happens, seems like we end up taking the whole hour, so we'll see. But uh, <laughs> uh, I added to the agenda to talk about some of in-memory rescue operating systems, how that might relate to some of the cloud native things that we're primarily focused on here, um, as well as just being interesting things because we're all kind of operating system uh, enthusiasts, I guess. So um, feel free to add anything else to the agenda. I'll, I'll throw a, a link to that in chat just in case anyone does not have that. Uh, but otherwise, um, I'll hand it over to you, Ed. Thanks. Um, I'm Ed Vilmedi. I'm at Equinix, where I run our open source partner program. Um, one of the things uh, that we offer at Equinix uh, for people doing bare metal servers uh, is a rescue operating system. And the notion is that on a node or set of nodes, you have um, a problem of some sort that you want to fix that you, for some reason, unspecified, can't fix simply by uh, loading up your normal operating system. Um, and um, our particular configuration, which we call Rescue OS, is Alpine Linux based, for better or for worse. Very small, runs in memory, um, so that you can boot it over, essentially boot it over iPixie, and then as needed, mount various drives or probe the hardware to figure out and fix a, a hardware fault or perhaps a storage fault or something. Um, uh, it's it's very helpful, um, but uh, it's not the only possible way of uh, doing uh, doing rescue in a cloud native kind of way. Uh, and so I wanted to talk through a couple of challenges that we've had, things we've thought about, and um, ideas for what it might be to have um, systems of this kind. And I'm familiar with, so I'll sort of set up the, the, the constraints, right? You want to boot into an operating system that runs completely in memory, that doesn't depend on any disk. And you also selectively have a not infrequent desire to mount really any drive that you have storage on on that hardware, uh, whether it be a ext4 file system, a ZFS file system, ButterFS, um, some sort of Windows file system, what have you. So there's there's constraints there. You, we I think would also like the rescue environment to be as similar as possible to the runtime environment for operating systems that have a shell and tooling and whatnot, so that you have the least delta between what you're familiar with and what you need to do. Um, to give examples of this kind of thing, um, uh, I think the one that comes to mind is Kali Linux, um, which has a whole bunch of tooling in it for diagnostics and debugging uh, hardware, uh, that sort of thing. Um, you know, other desirable things that you would likely want to do is probe the firmware, up maybe update the firmware, interrogate the system, what have you. Um, so um, from a cloud native perspective, and it was emphasized to me that every every uh, operating system discussion in, in this forum should have a cloud native perspective on it, uh, really two things come to mind. Um, one is uh, kind of the, the hope that we have that cloud native systems can be built on top of bare metal. Um, and we've, I think, reasonably successfully proven, proven that out to, to, you know, to justify that. Um, but with bare metal comes bare metal sorts of issues. And so especially if you have a node that has a lot of storage on it, you may be motivated to sort of pop out of the completely cloud native environment and bring up some sort of shell on that device simply because you do not want to um, copy a whole bunch of data off of a node. Um, the other thing from a cloud native perspective is the thought that 
hey, maybe these runtime rescue environments can really be containers. Um, and so you would boot into some environment that would let you load a container that would have a interactive environment, whether it be a shell or a web service or what have you, that would let you do your fiddly hardware specific bits. Um, and by having a container containerized runtime, um, you could potentially solve for the problem of having a familiar runtime uh, for this sort of rescue environment. So that's the kind of thinking I'm coming from. Um, I am happy to talk more about the specific rescue OS environment that we have, but I think uh, I prefer to sort of open up the open up the floor to either observations or questions or suggestions or directions for maybe where this sort of thing uh, might be explored, uh, including suggestions of other working groups or other operating system specific sorts of things. If if this is not the perfect forum for it, maybe there's an adjacent forum that would be good. Go ahead. I'll hand it back. Oh, go ahead. So, so I guess two, one, one observation is that yeah, I assume that this rescue OS needs to have all of the networking device drivers because you need to be able to talk on the network as well, not just storage, right? Right. So um, it needs to certainly have enough networking device drivers to come up. Uh, the way that we implement things is that we we proxy uh, an IPMI console over SSH. So we have uh, serial over SSH as our implementation plan. So at least in theory, even if your networking drivers were completely broken, you could still get in through the management console through the management LAN. Um, on a server rather than the primary NICs. And I'll, I'm happy to happy to run through that again if that. Yeah, if I'm trying to figure out which is, what is on top of what. Is it is it SSH on top of the IPMI serial? Yes. Yeah, it's a, okay. it's, a, it's a proxy. So there's a there's a proxy server that carefully um, uh, marshals credentials and makes sure that only you are allowed to reach the server that you have uh, provisioned. Okay. I guess the other sort of question is, yeah, you're making, I know I've used Equinix Metal, uh, so, but but I, you sort of like, you're assuming that you have, you're controlling enough of the network environment that you don't have to worry about no inbound connectivity, et cetera, that you might have in other deployment deployment locations where you have something sitting on LD or 5G far away and you need to be able to reach that somehow, right? Right. Uh, um, I, I think the other, the other key piece of this, so I may have conflated two things, right? There's the, the rescue environment where you boot into, uh, where you, where somehow, right, somehow you boot into a in-memory operating system. Um, to your point, you do need enough of a control plane to trigger that IPixie yeah. event. Um, and if you're at the far end of a 5G connection, um, that that may introduce complications. Um, mm -hmm. now but just also, it's sort of connectivity that you reach in yeah if you have if you're assuming that you have a bmc and you have ipmi through that or whatever right okay well yeah you have that if you have your managed data center environment you might not right. have it if you put it out towards the edge right but i think i think the general notion of of a rescue os is very interesting because we we you know we have we have customers running EOS in remote places and they ask us how do we update firmware and we say we don't deal with firmware right you do, you, your hardware vendor will will tell you how to update the BIOS uh, whatever is storage firmware whatever you might need right and 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 good luck right we we will make sure that in a, in from a sort of a, a measured secure boot that it doesn't change because someone else changed it right. But but sort of like the mechanism for doing this stuff is like okay too hard right too too much diversity 
hardware, right? And having yeah, some hardware updates are always too hard. Yeah. Um, I like the idea you mentioned earlier that you're basically separating the operating system part and that is drivers um, and environment and everything that basically Equinix Metal would care about to you know hand off the user as working and the user environment part where you empower the user to actually you know um, go into the environment that they that they are comfortable with uh, for debugging and uh, giving them the tools that they would need to tackle their specifics um, on their deployments like uh, file system support and things like that and i think ha having that ex that that split uh, expressed in a um, in a containerized environment for the user would give you a few options so um, you could you could focus on you know very lean base OS um, and just cherry pick the few items, uh, the few drivers, and of course all of the file system support because you never know what the user was using um, that uh, that you would need for Equinix Metal hardware, and then hand everything off um, in a may, maybe even a default container of the favorite distro of the user. Um, that 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 sounds interesting because you would drop them um, into a pretty much well-known environment and they, they would be knowing what they're doing up to the point where they might even use automation that they're using in production to kind of recover their, their tools because the environment is the same. So I, I, that's clearly interesting uh, in, in this approach. And I mean, I'm, it's, it's pretty much special purpose. Like we're, we're not narrowing um, down things too much. Um, I don't even think we explicitly call out cloud native focused special purpose operating systems, although we might imply so by you know naming examples like Kubernetes and um, uh, wasm workloads. But then I mean we have we have Unicraft here right with us, right. so um, there there are I think there's a certain flexibility and would be interesting like at least for me personally. Um, having having this kind of angle represented in the in the working group would be very interesting, just because you know there's such a such a, a big use case for that. Um, I could imagine many um, infrastructure providers actually need to provide this in one way or the other, and everybody's solving their own uh, solving that problem by themselves. So having some degree of um, of unification, at least for the areas that overlap, would be uh, would be interesting. Thanks, Tilo. Yeah, I, I I think the, you know, the the common denominator of need um, uh, includes things like Eric mentioned the firmware updates, right? So that's a yeah. that's a, something that happens uh, below the operating system level. Well, sort of at sort of, it's it's pretty close to the bottom of the stack, um, yeah. and. Uh, the the thought of containerizing the the rescue runtime um, is primarily ergonomic, so that the user does not have to, you know, in our current rescue OS, uh, it really helps if you really know Alpine, um, and yeah. that's that's not. Uh, I love Alpine, but it's not a feature that everyone needs to know. No one love Alpine. Um, so, yeah, thanks. Thanks for the comments. It's worth 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 thinking through that separation of uh, runtime versus drivers, um, or or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. The the other interesting thing that I like about this, like what you said, with the um, giving an environment that that they they may be a little more familiar with. I think we already kind of have some of that pattern in some of the other OSs here that, like for instance, Bow Rocket is, uh, there's no shell, there's no package manager. It's a read-only file system. Um, so when someone needs to do something, troubleshooting, whatever, uh, there's an admin container that that is optionally enabled. So it's not usually there, but you can turn it on and then that provides SSH. Uh, it has a shell. It has a package manager if you need to install additional tools. 
Um, so it does provide that more comfortable environment for that that a Linux administrator may be more familiar with to allow, you know, maybe copying off data or or poking around, even though it's still read-only, you can, you know, getting into things that normally you wouldn't um, have access to directly. So the kind of the, the cool thing it sounds like with this is Rescue OS is providing that for for anything. So any kind of cloud instance uh, is especially useful in a bare metal environment where it doesn't matter what's on that bare metal instance, you have this, this consistent environment that users can access. So yeah, that, it's interesting. I mean, there, there, there seems to be a, a few second second level, second degree benefits um, from um, containerization that you would win. For instance, if the user doesn't manage to you know, fully recover um, whatever they were doing, they're not depending on a extremely volatile, they don't, they don't need to depend on an extremely volatile system, a rescue as with all of the state that they put in there and they need to you know, somehow capture, instead they could, um, they could actually save that state because they're using a container, right? So there is a, there is an implied mechanism to somehow uh, persist that state because that's that's what containers do. And you could pick it up and basically continue your work later on. Um, of course, there's like a whole rabbit hole of things that you need to solve for this in order for this to work. But it would it would at least you know enable the option of this having. Hmm. So so saving state for the session independently of saving state on the machine itself. It, I don't know if independently, right? Maybe maybe the user would be required to have at least access to some storage on the device. So you don't need to, you know, th throw any more Equinix metal side um, uh, resources into the pool. Um, so that would be that would be probably the most uh, uh, the most um, straightforward option, or even be able to pull the state remotely. So they achieved a certain state and they want to save it on their local machine, and they happen to not be on a five G um, uplinks, but on a on a you know wide enough channel they could actually receive it, and then somehow submit that but, but this is like you know this is um solving the third step before the first it would enable you a lot of options that's what i'm trying to say yep agreed um, on the topic about uh, alpine uh just sharing what our approach is at kairos because uh, um yeah depending who you ask is a, a feature or not to have uh, a specific os right and um, in, our, in our case, Kairos works more like a framework that you install on top of other distributions. And this framework tries to uh, bring all these different tools. And in some cases, we've gone as far as to write it ourselves uh, on Go. And in other cases, we simply use the different package managers, for example, of the different uh, uh, distributions. And um, yeah, it, it really depends, I guess, what you're trying to achieve there. Uh, where is the um, generality that, that the users will benefit on, right? Yeah, so I'm thinking of some specific use cases that would motivate some, um, motivate some decisions. Um, one specific use case uh, imagine that you have a drive, uh, it has some firmware, you need to update the drive firmware. Okay, so typically there's some vendor tooling necessary to do that. Um, it, it, it's going to require some sort of system that can run that vendor tooling to, to do that. Or a NIC, NIC firmware needs to be updated or got, God knows there's so much firmware on a current system, there's just a lot of opportunities to do that. Um, and then imagine in trying to do that at scale, where your task is not update the firmware on one special Snowflake machine, but automate the process of firmware updates across a wide spectrum of stuff. Um, so to that end, 
I was looking at um I was looking at Tinkerbell, um, which emerged from Equinix Metal, but it has been adopted by the community is now a CNCF project. Um, and they have the notion of I forget what they what I forget what it's called, but basically um um I don't know, runtime scripts or something like that, where where you can install a module into Tinkerbell and then remotely trigger that that module be run on a specific node at boot time or at launch time or what have you. And so that the, the uh, if if for instance um, the uh, script would be something like uh, mount a Windows file system. Um, uh, authenticate the BitLocker configuration for it. Um, load a uh, load the file system in. Uh, delete a specific file. Save everything and reboot. That was the the, the Cloud Strike uh, rescue process. That you could potentially have a uh, environment that lent itself to scripting that. So you didn't have to write a lot of code to do that. Um, and I can imagine any 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 number of other circumstances where you would, in addition to wanting to have this environment, also have some desire for some tooling around it so that you could automate task handling in that environment, um, whether it's running a script or having a system D unit that runs a script once or remotely triggers, like um, there's more than one way to do it. Um, but basically um, uh, have a, a control plane that would allow you to boot into the rescue OS, run through a specific set of tools uh, and then shut it down and, and restart. Um, and again, maybe maybe I'm in in Tilo's uh, world of solving problem number three before I solve problem number one. Uh, but just thinking ahead to the sort of painful tasks that are out there um, that you don't know in advance what you need to automate, but you certainly might need to have some sharp tools around to do the automation. It it also helps a lot to better understand the uh, the the use case you're basically thinking uh, thinking forward to. So I, I find it's really helpful. Um, though I mean, since you know, if your your only tool is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. Uh, like this this thing where um, you automatically boot something that then does something and then shut it down again. Like suspiciously looks like a good use case for flat car because you would configure everything before um before you deploy and then pass on the configuration and um if whatever you configure didn't come to be the provisioning would fail so you would get um, the, uh, immediate feedback um but I think this is just tools thinking so there's like a number of ways um. Or a number of tools which uh, uh, with which you could implement that. What is interesting on the on the thing that you mentioned is um, the question on where you where you split responsibility. Um, you know, when when updating hundreds or thousands of nodes um, with this approach, where you, where you split responsibility between the um, Equinix Metal control plane, the API. And um, all of the features that API uh, this API provides to well start instances or start specific operating systems like rescue operating systems on instances, and then the custom logic. Um, so looking at Tinkerbell would basically move almost everything into the custom logic. Um, Tinkerbell would provision a node right from probably outside because the management cluster for um, whatever your trying to orchestrate would be uh, a separate Equinix metal machine or, or even a separate, entirely separate machine. And then boot those machines with a custom OS that then runs a custom workload um, because all of this automation that's already implemented where you can turn things down again. Um, and I think there there might even be a sweet spot, but I'm, I'm not too familiar with the, um, the extent uh, in, in which you could do this automation uh, with the Equinix metal API alone. 
And then what's missing, uh, what, what Tinkerbell would be bringing uh, in, in value to the to the orchestration. Thanks, Tilo. I guess it also depends um, what kind of uh, setup you have, right? Because with Kairos, I'm thinking at the edge, we generally have cheaper devices, so to speak, where it it's sometimes uh, faster and easier to just, uh, you know, send a new device, plug and play, and send back the old device than to actually try to do some sort of recovery because then you might need to send an engineer there and that would be actually more problematic uh, just thinking a bit on, on, on our specific use case but I guess you have uh, other specific scenarios that you're thinking of yeah I'm I'm familiar with the with the specific use case of um, is it cheaper to debug a node in place or to roll a truck and ship a new node to, to replace it. Um, I worked on a controller for a solar energy farm and um, I was the guy in the truck actually in the car that would have to drive a hundred miles to fix something. Um, so we, we did all we could to avoid a three hour round trip to do a repair. Um, but even, even then, um, you don't want to go through heroic measures um, to do something that could be easily field replaceable. Um, I'm, I guess I have a, a lot more sympathy for people who are debugging things like, um, you know, storage arrays or something where there's a lot of gravity to the specifics of the node and sure you could replace it, but really maybe you'd rather not just have to swap something out entirely when when some correctable action was there um i there's there's lots of ways to architect a system right you can architect it with entirely disposable nodes where everything can go away at any time you don't care about any of it or as you get more old school and sort of less cloud native um, systems look like you're going to boot them once and keep them running until the end of life of the operating system or the end of life of the hardware. Um, so more more than one way to do it. Yeah, I hear you. I remember, uh, I don't know if you guys were there at last KubeCon each day in Europe, and uh, there was a presentation from the French uh, railways and how they had to provision for 20 years afterwards. So, yeah. Yeah. So some of your software decisions are going to be influenced by those sorts of hardware constraints. Um, all right. Well, I'm, I'm happy uh, with the, with the results to date from all of your feedback. Uh, Sean, Tilo, Eric, Morrow, I really appreciate the, the ideas that you shared. Um, I'll try to, um, to do a bit more homework as to how we actually do some things. Um, I, I do know that the Rescue OS discussion is ongoing and that there are grand plans to do things differently, but I don't really know... Uh, what direction things are going to change in yet and i um will be uh, eager to find out uh if there's a general purpose uh lots of people do it not just us here uh that we can learn from so so are you going to do more work today you talk about you're looking at the web pages it talks about a rescue mode but there isn't sort of a name for a rescue os as far as i can tell right yeah, there's a there's a if you boot into that environment, you get a splash screen with something that says Rescue OS, okay. but it's really not branded as such, and really, the the mechanics of it are are not um, fully, lovingly, intensely documented. You, it's you know the the messaging you get is, it's based on Alpine. Here's a package manager. There's lots of packages for it. 
um, if you need to do this, you should study up. Um, that is, yeah, I mean, is this, oh, sorry, go ahead, Eric. No, no, it's sort of like, if you guys are going to do some more work, it might make sense to pick a name for this stuff as well, so that other people can be easier for other people to find out about it and make, make, um, sort of, you know, find documentation about it, etc. But yeah, that's okay. because I, I'm, it would be interesting to sort of understand what people have done when they've done firmware updates out in the field, if they sent out a guy with a USB stick and boot it into the BIOS and whatever, right? So how, how do people do this? I, I haven't seen it myself, right? So, um, and if there, this would be a better alternative for them, but yeah. Go ahead, John. So is this uh, something that Equinix plans on making an open source project or um, is that still part of figuring out what direction the company's going with it? I think it's part of still figuring out what direction uh, it's going in. Um, I know that there's uh, interest at least in providing a, a familiar operating system as a rescue option. Um, and so that'll probably be very closely derived from some existing familiar distribution, whether it be a enterprise Linux distribution for people on the enterprise Linux side of the fence or something that uses Debian and Ubuntu packages from that side of the fence or something that's very specifically tailored to the maintenance needs that we have internally. Um, if I had to bet, and I won't, I won't promise anything. But um, uh, if if there was an option to boot into an in-memory Ubuntu, that would probably be really helpful for people um, as a as sort of a first pass of like, how would you do things differently? I'd say, well, do everything you're doing right now, but in but in addition to offering Alpine as a choice offer something that gave you a Ubuntu Debian shell, and that would be a first step for 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 people who are familiar with that environment. So the, the approach reminds me a lot um, on the feedback that we were, sorry, the feedback that we were getting for our, um, our interactive debug container for Flatcar. I, actually forgot how we're, how we're calling it. It's, it's basically just a wrapper script around um, around Docker pulling the latest. I think by default, it's Fedora. And then it just gives you a number of things that you would want to have from the host right into the container, runs the container in privilege mode because you're there already. Um, and if you're on a flat car node, um, then basically um, you, you could just act anyways. So and this this allows you to kind of land in a uh, in a trusted environment. So it is not regularly used because well I mean this is not how you use Flatcar, but it's a, it's a relatively um, similar use case, right? It's just that people then uh, uh, then would um, uh, play around with their actual local machines instead of trying to rescue them from a um, uh, fr from an in-memory machine, but uh, in general, um, I think it's a it's a very interesting use case to tackle. Um, I'd love to hear like your your path forward there and uh, your your further um, your further thinking and developments in 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 that area. That would be exciting, I think. Yeah, I'd love to. Uh, if you can, Tila, if you can send me a pointer to the like dev container documentation. Yeah, I, I'm happy to happy to take a look at that because I'm also as much as anything collecting examples of uh, there's more than one way to do this and here's how as opposed to here's my bright idea for doing doing it the best way. I think there's likely to be lots of satisfactory methods for yeah. this kind of environment. I, I, I just checked dev container was the wrong term. Um, actually, dev container just contains um, a few addition, additional kernel sources and the compiler um, any given Flatcar instance was built for. I'll, I'll figure it out for you. OK. It's um, it's some some other kind of dev environment. or And it's so rarely used that um, I don't have it on top of my mind <laughs> how we even call it. But I'll find it for you. Thank you.
All right. Well, with that, I'll wrap my piece of the agenda. Sean, you want to take the take it and uh, probe for anything else that people might want to talk about? Yeah, yeah. I was just going to say that no one else has added anything else to the agenda, so it's kind of just open floor right now. If anyone has anything they want to discuss, um, you know, okay. last chance to bring it up. Otherwise, I, we can wrap up. I saw that our last meeting was in in early August, and I was still on vacation. Since then, there 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 was like one very exciting development in the in the flat cover, and that is the um, CNCF vote to have Flatcar join the CNCF as an incubating project. So we're basically hopping over Sandbox because we're, we've been in production for years, literally. And um, it is it is awesome and it is humbling uh, to be part of this organization. Um, as we've done before, we want to use our position to actually leverage um, what we're doing for, for the whole ecosystem, for the whole industry. We've done so with System DSSX. Um, and particularly our system, the upstream work with mutable SysX, which we don't strictly need because we're an immutable OS. But we think SysX are such a great idea, people should just be able to use them on any distro. Um, and it's just one example. Uh, this is what we strive for. And um, this is what I feel we'll, we'll use our position as the NCF for. So yeah, it's awesome news for the team. Yeah, congrats. Thank you. Yeah, congrats and thanks, Edward, for bringing the other topic. It was very interesting. Uh, on my side, uh, uh, the only thing I think at some point we should discuss is uh, Vienna, because uh, at least I will be on vacation next week. Um, but uh, we can just play it the way we did uh, previous uh, KubeCon and meet there during launches or something and uh, figure it out. And just to be clear, because I'm not going to the event, it's Open Source Summit Europe. Is that the name of the? Thank you. Yep, that's on. Yeah, looking forward to seeing some people face to face again. Yeah, same. I found it at uh, it's the toolbox container. It's not the. The dev container, it's the tool. And it just as I said, it's just a wrapper script on, on, on starting the latest Fedora Docker image. Um that makes it easier for folks, you know, to install stuff and they interactively um work on Flatcar, why ever they would be choosing to do it. But then that's the mechanism that they have. Okay. If there aren't any other topics to discuss, then I think we can wrap up for now. Um, and see each other soon. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. See you. Thanks, Thanks all. Thanks. Bye. So long, Eric.